Aloha, and welcome to Condo Insider, a Vai show about association living, whether it be a condo or a homeowner association. And, and we're celebrating about 175 episodes we've done uh, to help educate our board members as well as our owners about the opportunities, rights, and obligations living in a condo association. And today I'm really excited because we have a really good person who I've known for a long time, our House Speaker, the House of Representative Speaker for the state of Hawaii, Scott Psyche. And we're going to talk to us about kind of what's going on with the legislature, what we can expect in 2021, and, and some of the challenges we have uh, in the association industry, and maybe uh, some discussion about some potential bills anyway. And so welcome, Scott, to the show. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Richard, for inviting me today. Glad to be here. Yeah, can you share a little bit about you know your legislative background, how you got into the legislature, and who you represent? I know who you represent, but uh, tell us who you represent, and and uh, are you having a good time right now? It seems like a difficult time for uh, any legislator. Yeah, it's been a challenge for all of the um, members of the legislature. Um, so I, you know, when I a uh, few years a few years after I graduated from law school, um, one of the state house members was uh, planning on retiring. So he, he asked me to run for his seat and basically recruited me. And so that's kind of how I got my start. And, you know, I think we're just really excited that it would be an opportunity to kind of work on community projects, um, state projects, you know, ba basically public service in general. So it's been, you know, it's been a great um, experience and um, I've really enjoyed it. So I currently represent uh, House District 26, which runs basically from Macaulay through Kakako. And um, so I do uh, own and reside in a condo unit in Kakako. So, you know, I just want your viewers to know that I kind of know firsthand what, you know, condo owners and condo, res condo residents go through on a daily basis and how, you know, how their condo operations and their condo lives have been impacted uh, by, by the pandemic. There's an interesting statistic, by the way, that because uh, I'm uh, I belong to the Community Association Institute, which is our national trade body, and I went to a national seminar. And one of the interesting things they were saying is that pre-COVID, the rate of delinquencies in condominiums nationwide, so this is not specifically Hawaii, was about nine to ten percent of the owners in a condominium were delinquent, which might be a minor delinquency of just thirty days, but uh, were delinquent, not paid in the current month. But after COVID, the national statistic was 10 to 11%. It hadn't changed that much, but you know, you can see it changed by 10% because the difference between 10 and 11% is about 10%. But uh, most people believe that the, the worst is yet to come on that matter, you know? Yeah, I mean, I gotta believe that um, without seeing the specific, you know, the analysis behind the numbers, I mean, I got, I got to believe that maybe people have been given um, chances, right? Um, if they're behind for some reason, um, especially, and you know, the governor did, um, um, you know, issue a, a emergency proclamation, at least trying to deal with renters to, to avoid evictions. And then we have at the federal level, um, there was a, pro, a prohibition on, on um, for federally financed uh, mortgages, there was a prohibition on, um, on um, also on actions being taken against owners. So um, I'm, I'm assuming that there will be a delayed effect, there will be a delayed impact and we might see a higher number. Well, I think most people believe that, you know, the worst is yet to come, you know, we're dealing with the uh, pandemic part, the COVID part, but the economy is gonna have a lingering effect for probably some time. Uh, but, you know, you as a legislator, um, and I, I have to give you a compliment because I've known you for a while, but you know, one of my favorite people of all time was uh, Mark Takai, who was uh, elected to Congress, who um, I helped uh, supported strongly when he was running for office. And I considered him one of the best legislators we've ever had. And you remind me of him very, very much. You know, you have a very good demeanor about you and a style about you. And I know your dedication to this and 
I, I feel like we always thank the first responders and the police officers and the medical people, but you know, the legislators have a tough job. And so I think we should be thanking our legislators for standing up for public service. And so I'll thank you there before I ask you this question. And that question was, you know, it's gotta be a tough year going into 2021 for the legislature. How are we gonna handle that? Are we gonna allow testimony or, or is there, are we gonna have lots of bills? It seems like it's gonna be a zoo. Yeah, so ever since the shutdown in March, the state capitol building has been closed down, uh, closed to the public. Uh, although there, there are people have been working in the building. Um, so I'm expecting that when we convene our regular session in January, on January 20, that um, the building will still remain closed to the public, which means that um, number one, you know, we will have the house members physically present in the building to attend committee hearings and floor sessions, um, but the public will have to be zoomed in to participate. So we are, um, we've been working for the past few months to build up the infrastructure at the Capitol, the IT infrastructure to handle um, virtual, virtual hearings, um, to ensure that the public can be, can access our public hearings and participate at the hearings, you know, by providing uh, testimony. So that is, the, that is the plan for now. I would, I would assume that, you know, you certainly are probably gonna encourage written testimony, but on top of that, that people will have to make a reservation or something because I mean, there's, you know, there's a 1.4 million people here. So, I mean, I would assume there's gotta be some way that uh, I, can't, I can't see that you just can dial in on Zoom and, 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 right. and, and, uh, and uh, just jump in. Right, we'll have a procedure set up to accept written testimony and then to have um, individuals sign up to testify at the hearing. And, um, you know, we'll probably have maybe a, tw a, a, a cutoff time uh, for, both of, for both of those. Now, the other thing I see in the legislature, uh, being I'm down there a lot, is that there's usually, you know, there's usually thousands of bills introduced. A lot of them are by request. And, and it's like, uh, it's, it's, it's a chance to, for everybody to throw this stuff out. Are you going to try to limit this at all? Or are you going to just kind of as normal? Yeah. So we've asked, um, you know, we've asked our members to, um, to, you know, to, to be very judicious and, uh, with their bill introductions this year, uh, as you mentioned, usually there's about 2000, a little over 2000 bills introduced in the house, um, every year, but we, um, you know, we are going to try to limit the number of bills, um, we want the, the members to prioritize bills. Um, so we'll see, how, we'll see how it goes. For our audience's uh, information, because I track this, uh, the condo world, which we live in, we run from about 30 bills to 150 bills a year that are introduced. Many of them are kind of companion bills and duplicates and by request. But uh, I'm hoping that uh, this year we have only the essential bills introduced because it's going to be hard on our legislators to deal with so much and uh, uh, but the legislature is very active on associations and and I feel it's a good thing because they balance the rights of the owner and the obligations of the boards so they try to have a consumer protection basis to it when it uh, when we do that so you know one of the things COVID has brought up is that this whole thing on what you're going to guys are going to do is have virtual meetings you know under the current statute Condos or associations don't have the ability to ha have virtual meetings and vote. How do you guys see that? Or how do you see it? Yeah, so there's a couple of statutes um, in the, on the books now that address um, association meetings and board meetings. So interestingly, the statute that governs board meetings does the way it's worded, it does provide some flexibility for board meetings to be held virtually. But that language does not appear in the statute for association meetings. It, the association meeting statute requires basically in-person meetings, um, you know, on on the site. So uh, I'll be working with your organ your organization and with the condos to uh, introduce a bill um, this session to see if we can amend the association meeting statute to provide the flexibility to hold hold virtual meetings. Um, we have this year a new, uh, some new committee chairs and the committee in the house that deals with condo issues is the Committee on Consum Commerce and Consumer Protection. 
And we have a new chair, Representative Aaron Johansson, um, who represents the Moana Loa Aiea area. So he also has condos in his district, and he's aware of of the concerns that you know condo condos um, are are going through. So I'll be working with him um, and asking him to take the lead on this bill. Yeah, I have some experience with Aaron. He's a very good legislator and been very balanced. And you know, he's done a really good job with. Uh, open ears and willing to talk and understands kind of the issues. But you see this proposed, I know, I know it's speculation until you get an actual bill and, and language which gets amended, but, but do you see it being broad based? You can do it forever or is it gonna be limited to like a hurricane or a pandemic or how do, you, how, do you, how do you personally see that? I think as introduced, it'll probably be limited to emergency situations, but you know, I, I think, th I think there, that there should be some uh, public discussion on whether it should be broader and apply, you know, th throughout the year. Um, I think I think you know one of the one of the um, one of the re uh, things we've seen through this pandemic is that people are a little bit more used to virtual meetings. They're 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 used to these these kinds of meetings. So it may be it may be the normal thing to do at some point. And so our law should should be flexible. I think the challenge, just to share with our, our viewers, that uh, from my experience is we started at uh, my company, we started working on this two or three years ago on uh, the concept of voting in virtual meetings. And the challenges with condominiums are it's not like one person, one vote. They have these percentages of common interest that have to be tallied, you know, based on your ownership. And, and some, believe it or not, some larger condos have as many as 40 different percentages of common interest. And then they have the parking stall common interest and all these things. And then you throw in the concept of cumulative voting, where in some associations you can stack, you know, stack your votes towards one person to get them on board. Uh, that none of the technology out there in voting exists today to deal with the way Hawaii's voting and, and condos is set up. But uh, we're working with some vendors to, to come up with a plan because it can be done, it's just technology. Uh, so we're going to have to look at the, when we look at these new bills, exactly how the voting side, um, there's a current, actually a current law on the statute that allows for electronic voting at a meeting. But the current statute says it has to be self-contained within the meeting. So you can't be over the internet. You, so you have to have like your own server there and the technology and for a big homeowner association of 500,000 people, they'd be giving clickers, but it's all internal within the association. So I think that I agree with you, we need to do this, but there's gonna be some technology issues that have to kind of follow quickly along with it. Yeah, so you should give us your information after you've done your um, analysis on the tech issues, you should provide that to us as soon as we'll you- We'll be happy to do that. The other thing that, uh, are you seeing this bill just for condos, or are you looking at putting in the, the same thing for a 421J homeowner association? I think it was going to be introduced for, I think we'll introduce it for both. We'll see how it goes. Okay. All right. So that's the virtual meeting side of that, but this is all being driven by COVID. And the common question I always get is, uh, you know, because associations are kind of private property in a way. This wearing of masks. How do you? How do you? Some people say I don't have to wear a mask. I don't have to follow because I'm not in the public, and you know, the, so the board can't enforce me wearing a mask. And in common elements, for example, how do you see that? Yeah. So let me just uh, explain that um, there was some confusion uh, about whether or not um, the mask rules apply to condos, and particularly for common for the common areas. Um, so the governor in November amended his emergency proclamation to make it clear that there is a statewide mask uh, requirement. And what it says is um, all persons in the state shall wear a face covering over their nose and mouth when in public. Um, on November 19, the health department issued um, an advisory opinion to clarify that this mask rule applies to common areas in, in condos. So there is a mask requirement. The exception is if you are six feet apart from someone, then you don't need a mask. But 
but you should, even in that situation, you should have a mask with you because as you know, people are gonna be walking around and someone's gonna be within six feet of you. So you have to put your mask on at that point. But um, yes, the mask rule does apply to common areas and condos. Well, masks didn't bother me because I had them from all the banks I robbed. So I always had them available <laughs> for me. But uh, on that note, I'm going to say we're going to take a one minute break. We're with our house speaker, Scott Psyche. We're going to come back and ask him a few more questions about what to expect in 2021. So we'll be back in one minute. Aloha and welcome back to Condo Insider. We're with our illustrious house speaker, Scott Psyche, who I've known for years and, and uh, talking about 2021, the legislature, some condo proposed bills, those types of uh, things. And he's been very helpful in explaining some of that. Um, and the last thing we ended up with was the, uh, you have to wear masks in common areas, carry one with you unless you're within six feet of somebody. But one of the problems we alluded to is the economy is going to get kind of bad. Uh, it's probably already bad in some ways for certain people. How do you see the rental assistance program going? You, I think that's been an issue in the paper quite a bit. And, and how do you see that shaking out? Yeah, so um, in, um, I think it was in a April when the state received um, it, its share of the federal CARES funds, um, the legislature set aside $100 million of that for a state rental assistance program. And it's because we knew that that was going to be one area where people are, would need immediate assist, uh, help and relief. So the program is being administered through non, two, two nonprofit organizations, um, Aloha United Way and the... Um, the uh, um, Hawaii Community Foundation. And those organizations are responsible for taking, app taking applications and processing applications. So I'll just give you a brief update on the status of that program. Um, the 9,000, and this, this program basically uh, provides funds for rental assistance up through December 31st. And um, 9,594 households have been assisted, have been approved. There are still 1,776 applications pending. The state has already made payments of about $41 million um, to those who, who have been approved. And there's another $12 million, $12 million in payments that are pending. So this, you know, this um, program has assisted thousands of uh, households um, in our state. And, you know, and not just renters, but also those who own units who are, who are renting to these individuals. So I think it's been, it's been a big success. I was kind of surprised when I read in the paper that a lot of landlords refused to check because they weren't paying their general excise tax. That seems to be a problem to me. Yeah, that's something we're gonna be looking at into. It's something that we weren't really, hadn't really anticipated, but I think there have been some cases where, where that's, where that's ha happened, unfortunately. Well, I think all of us, certainly the state needs money right now. I, all the states in the country need money, but uh, this is an obligation that existed before COVID and it's kind of 
uh, not the thing you should do. You should be paying your taxes and, and being responsible reporting it. And, and right. uh, I hope the state does put in some uh, checks and balances and, and enforcement because uh, everybody should be paying their, their taxes in that area. So how do you feel generally about you know, the, the state and the economy? Do you, do you, are we gonna get through this? Are we gonna all live? Or, or what do you see for the, for the, for the next year? Yeah, so, you know, a couple of things. One is that, um, you know, we know, we acknowledge that the top priority is um, public health and safety. We have to make sure that Hawaii residents, um, you know, are going to be healthy and safe during this pandemic, um, which leads to the second area, which is that, um, you know, a, a healthy population here is going to lead to a healthy economy. And, you know, we know that, you um, that the reopening of our economy will be incremental. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take time. And as we as we work through it, um, you know, there's a couple of things to remember. One is that um, we need to learn how to manage the risk of COVID in our state. We will never have zero cases, even with a vaccine. We will not have zero COVID cases in our state. So we have to be able to manage the risk of cases occurring in the future. And we do that through our public health programs, you know, our, our, our screening, uh, testing, uh, quarantine programs, as well as the vaccination program. And then the second thing is that, you know, it's important to remember that um, as we manage the risk that, um, you know, we do have a, we have a statewide economy and it's important that every component of our economy, um, you know, stays in place and helps and participates in rebuilding in rebuilding our economy. Um, tourism is, um, you know, our top, one of the pillars of our economy. And it's really important that we reopen tourism gradually and safely, because it has such a big impact. Um, not just on hotels and airlines and car rental companies, but all kinds of small businesses throughout our state that rely on, on tourist, um, tourist revenue. So I, I think that, um, you know, what is happening now is positive. We're seeing incremental, uh, incremental uh, growth in our economy, incremental growth in tourism numbers. Um, the caseload, you know, even as of today is still relatively low. I think there are about 100 34 cases today. Um, so we just have to continue to manage the risk while we reopen our economy incrementally. We want to mean and we do want to maintain the public and health and safety while we do that. And my view, and I'm, and I'm just talking as a one resident of a wonderful state, is that I hear about diversifying the economy. And I think that's good. But to me, you're never going to not be in the tourist business. It's, no matter what you do and no matter how you diversify, tourism is going to be the cornerstone to Hawaii's economy. I don't yeah. see any way around that. We can mitigate its influence to a degree, but you're, you're never going to not have tourism in Hawaii. Right. And we need to find ways that we can um, have tourists come back safely and the population to be safe, but not make it so overburdened with checks and balances that nobody wants to come because it's a pain in the coli to come here. Right. And, you know, we, you're right. Tourism is a pillar in our economy. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't think that we should go back to the pre pandemic time when we saw 30,000 tourists arriving every day. I think it has to be, tourism has to be managed, um, but it will always be a part of, of a very vibrant part of our economy. So do you, do you have any, where, where do you see the, the makeup between, if we, don't, if we go to from 30,000 to 20,000, it's certainly less tax revenue and, and uh, less jobs. Where do you, what, what areas do you see us picking that, that difference up in? Yeah, so we're gonna have to, you know, we're gonna have to shore up some other areas um, of, our, of our economy. You know, the mil military spending has been constant during the pandemic. I think that we may see increased military spending in Hawaii. Um, that's one area that we, you know, I feel that we should be 
Hawaii should be proud of its role in, in um, as far as the military presence here. Um, we, um, we have a lot of businesses and a lot of families uh, that depend on the, mil on the revenue that, that, that we see from, from, the, from the military side. I think we're also gonna see um, more aggressive um, initiatives being taken um, in the agriculture area. Um, what we've seen during the pandemic is that farmers need help with, not just with production, but distribution. Distribution is a big logistical uh, issue for them. I think if we are able to try to iron out some of the dis distribution issues, that may help um, help ease the burden on, on farmers. Um, University of Hawaii is gonna have to step up. I think we're gonna have to, um, you know, make Hawaii a place where we see a lot of um, uh, research and development going on where there's, where there's different kinds of initiatives um, that will attract not just Hawaii residents, but also um, in industries from other states and even other for from foreign countries. So there's a, there's a lot of areas that we need to focus in on. Some of them are short term, some of them are going to be medium and long term, but we have to, you know, we have to start planning for that now. Well, we've come to the end of our show. So let me, first of all, thank you for all of your effort for the state of Hawaii. It is a sacrifice to do public servant work. And I know from my own experience, uh, how seriously and important you take this, how hard you do work uh, for the residents and the owners and the consumers and uh, the population of Hawaii in your job. And so I wanna thank you for that. And I wanna say to our audience, uh, we look forward to seeing you next Thursday at three o'clock for another interesting show. I think next week we're talking about the issues of smoking in condos and marijuana and those types of issues. But again, happy holidays, Scott. Thank you from your very, very busy schedule taking time to be with us today. And aloha to all of you and happy holidays to you as well. Thanks, Richard.